welcome to chapter 22 on geologic resources and it's kind of natural resources but try to focus on geological resources and what I mean about geological resources is the stuff that's coming out of the ground um, you know there's some things that kind of may not be a natural resource that may not be a geological resource you know timber from like trees and stuff that's not quite geology water we can argue whether water or not is a geological resource i kind of consider it a geologic resource but anyway <clears throat> we're mostly going to deal with the natural resources that are coming out of the ground and this is chapter 22 in your book and uh yeah i'm going to go through kind of what some of the different geological resources are um <clears throat> excuse me and uh yeah just kind of get into the details a little bit of them uh with maybe a little bit of focus on oil and gas just because well that's kind of why geology is as a big of a science as it as it is. More on that in a minute. If I can advance the slide. So we can break up geologic resources into kind of three different types. We've got in energy resources. We have metals and non-metallic resources. So energy resources are things that we consume to generate electricity, right? So that is the petroleum stuff, the oil and natural gas and coal. Uh, we can use uranium to get energy by, you know, harnessing the radioactivity off of that. Um, there's geothermal resources. You can basically stick a hole in the ground if it's hot near the surface and throw some water down there and put another hole nearby and let that water basically circulate and sort of drive a turbine. For the metallic resources, there's all sorts of metals we pull out of the ground. There's the really common ones you might know, you know, iron and copper, aluminum, lead, zinc, gold, silver. And there's more, you know, we can lump into here some of the more rare ones like platinums or the rare, the rare elements or metals, um, typically thought of as metals. Or kind of, at least I kind of lump them into that group uh, in terms of how they're mined. Uh, there's non-metallic resources like sand, gravel, limestone. Uh, in fact, here in Northwest Arkansas, we have a lot of these, and you may not have seen them. They're actually hidden pretty well, uh, unless you drive right, right by them. Um, if you go up and down 49, you're probably aware that the uh, kind of the big, big exit to get over to the airport, there's a big limestone mine that's there that you can kind of see kicking up dust a lot of the time, and the trucks kind of coming and going from that. Uh, but I kind of recommend get on Google Google Earth or Google Maps and uh, just kind of look. And if you look at Northwest Arkansas, kind of Benton and Washington County, if you see a couple of big white splotches here and there, those are mostly mines that are you know, non-metallic mines, and they're mostly mining uh, limestone for various reasons. Uh, there's one down south, I think, that's kind of doing more uh, sandstone, and, and I'm honestly not sure what that's kind of near uh, West Fork. Uh, you know, there's groundwater. We can talk about how water is used. We've got Beaver Lake up here, which has a big dam at the end of it that's used to kind of harness that water to create energy. Um, and also we use that lake. Most of our groundwater, it's chapter 22, you know this already. Most of our groundwater around here, or our drinking water around here that comes into our houses, uh, comes from Beaver Lake. And it didn't actually used to be the case. It actually used to be a lot of these little smaller lakes. So if you see the little smaller lakes on the map, those are actually, most of them are older, uh, lakes that were dammed up for drinking water for the smaller towns around in the region. And the Beaver Lake is a little bit newer. There's also renewable resources. Uh, this is your solar, this is your wind, um, and anything that can kind of be renewable. Water is kind of lumped in with that with hydroelectric dams. Uh, there's also non-renewable resources that we can talk about. So we can kind of lump all this stuff into non-renewable and renewable. Uh, a lot of these things are non-renewable because they're just not really forming anymore or they're forming at extremely low rates. There is new natural gas and coal that's forming in today's world, um, but it takes millions of years for that to kind of occur. So pretty much once we pull it out of the ground, it's not like we can wait a couple of weeks and there's more there for us to get. I don't want to go too much into this. Uh, it's important to be aware of. So we can kind of talk about resources and we can also talk about reserves. Talking about reserves is kind of getting into the economics of this. And it's important to know this. It's just important to be educated about this because I've, I've seen news headlines before and reports that will talk about, uh, in fact, I'm going to blow this up, that'll talk about, oh no, we only have 20 years left of copper. What are we going to do? 
And I've actually tracked those down before. Um, and I look at where the report that's coming from, and it'll be a USGS report on copper. And it'll talk about the, uh, the reserves that, that are available. Well, over time, the economics can change, or the technology can change, or we will just simply discover more, and it can kind of make these boxes uh, ebb and flow and get bigger, and typically they get bigger. Uh, and I actually pulled up annual reports for, what was it? I can't remember if it was copper or silver, but I, I saw the headline and I pulled up annual reports from the USGS for that. And surprise, surprise, every single report basically ended with, ah, uh, there's about 20 years left of reserves. So it's like every year for 20 years, we've got 20 years left. So, you know, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a big estimate or a very, uh, yeah, let's call it a guesstimate. And uh, really that there's there's plenty because there's a lot we haven't found or and it's not too hard to find or the economics of it change or the technology of recovering it changes. Uh, and so we're not necessarily running out. Uh, oil and gas actually had a really good example of this. You know, those of you that are about my age uh, may remember discussions about peak oil. We're going to run out of oil. Uh, and that was being talked a lot about in the early 2000s. And then the fracking revolution happens with shale and now all of a sudden we're able to get oil out of shale which is something we weren't really able to do before and boom the fracking revolution the fracking revolution happens uh and now all of a sudden there's more oil in the united states than there is anywhere else in the world or or at least we can now get a lot more oil out of the united states than than we can get from other countries and we don't have to be too dependent on other countries and frankly there's a ton of oil now that's now available uh, for us to pull out of the ground because of that uh, that technological change. So all that sub-economic stuff all of a sudden became quite economic. Or, um, you know, there's a lot more that's demonstrated that you can, you can pull out. So, energy resources. Uh, take some, uh, you know, th these numbers are... Uh, you know, they'll, they'll change a little bit. And this is from your book from, I you know, there's a little copyright down there. I forget what year this is. And the people that wrote this book are, I think from California. Um, this can change quite, quite a bit, depending on how you want to look at it, what you define as fuel. But in general, the big picture thing is, is accurate. In the U S we consume a lot of energy, especially for how many people are in, in the U S. Um, there's a lot of reasons for that. One is we're just a very developed country. We have a lot of technology. Two, we're also a large country. We're really spread out. So the amount of money I spend on gas, the amount of gasoline we spend per person is a lot more than, say, in Europe, where there's a lot more people for the amount of area. Um, the majority of the energy in the U.S., at least right now, this is, seems to be changing very quickly, uh, is from non-renewable resources and it's from hydrocarbons, which are oil, natural gas, and coal. So when I say hydrocarbon, uh, I'll just kind of abbreviate that as HC, I'm talking about these three, oil, natural gas, and coal. And if you actually look at the chemistry of these things, it's, it's in the name, hydrocarbon. It's basically these giant chains of carbon and hydrogen. And the simplest one starts with, oh, come on, starts with methane, CH4. I don't know why it does the big line thing. CH4, that's methane. And as you kind of kick up the, the chart, it goes from methane to ethane to butane to propane and ane, 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 ane. And you're pretty much just adding carbon uh, and hydrogen to, to this chemical formula. And I th what is it? I think, uh, I think ethane is C2H6, 8? I can't remember. You can look it up. Uh, but that's what these hydrocarbons are and the solids are pretty much coal the liquids are oil and the uh, the gases are of course natural gas so what about that coal uh in this class occasionally we'll actually look at a couple of samples of coal the one i know you're looking at that you have in your your lab kits if you're watching this online or for my online class is you've got bituminous coal 
by Duminus. Uh, also, sometimes I'll include, include anthracite, which is metamorphosed coal. It's metamorphic coal. Uh, but really, we have all these different grades of coal. And basically, the better the grade, the more valuable it is. Um, it's a lot of the energy we have here in the U.S., but it's changing quickly. So that number, 20% of the energy supply in the USA, I'm sure, is quite a bit different now. Uh, our coal reserves, yeah, we still produce a lot of coal. In fact, there is a picture. Again, this is this is kind of from your book, but it's fairly accurate. I could probably go pull up a better map of this um, from a, a better source. Uh, in fact, that better source I'll, I'll mention right now. If you want to know how the world works in terms of energy, and I'll say that the world works because of energy, all the geopolitical news and everything you see, if you understand what's going on with energy, all of a sudden it starts to make a little bit more sense. The, uh, the Russian invasion of Ukraine, if you understand the energy politics of Europe, in fact, the planet, uh, it starts to make a little bit more sense why Russia invaded Ukraine. Um, it has a lot to do with fracking, actually. And I may post a video of that where I kind of go into the more detailed effects of that. But basically, fracking was going to happen. There was going to be a lot of oil that was getting, oil, natural gas that is extracted from Ukraine, and that was going to go to Europe. And basically, Russia wasn't that's going to undercut, under, undercut the economy of Russia, which is a lot of oil and gas. And so Russia basically needed to act if they were going to lose that, uh, that resource. And so they chose to invade. Now, I'm not saying that's the only reason why Putin and Russia invaded Ukraine, but it's a big part to play. And if you look at what happened starting in 2014, which was kind of the beginning of all this, um, boy, it makes a lot of, a lot of sense because our big American companies were going in there uh, including some British companies and French companies, and they were making billion-dollar deals to to go drill for this stuff and remove it. And if you actually read the the contracts themselves, you could tell that boy, these companies were really confident that there was going to be a lot of material there, and uh, the infrastructure already exists in Ukraine. All the pipelines were already there, so it was going to be very simple. So basically. Russia destabilized Ukraine, and it caused those companies to say, nope, we're not going to deal with war, and they pulled out. But I digress. So, uh, EIA.gov is a very, very boring website, uh, but the amount of information and data on there, if you're into graphs and maps, man, this is your place to go. Uh, and they get better every year with improving kind of their uh, their visuals and what you can do with that information. And you can find really good maps that are kind of better and more accurate than what you're looking at here. Anyway. Um, so these are the coal fields in the U.S. There's a lot of them behind in the Appalachians. Basically, these are old basins where, you know, you can, we can kind of think of the Gulf of Mexico today as a, as a basin. You know, there's a the Mississippi River flows down into this and is dumping tons of sediment and other things in there. Uh, well, we used to have basins that were here and here on the back end of the Appalachians when that was getting all squished up and here, you know, here. And so when these things were kind of underwater or close to being underwater, uh, you'd get a lot of sediment and things in the water column that would die and settle. And so you can even see here into, uh, into Arkansas, we've got, got a little bit. So we've even got a little bit of coal here in Arkansas. I don't think that's being currently mined, but even recent history, uh, it, it was, those coal mines were, were up and running. Oh, and you see there's a lot of here out west. Wyoming is our big, biggest coal state. You might hear more about West Virginia being a coal state, but there's more of it coming out of Wyoming, and all of that will get shipped off uh, to the west coast and get shipped to and sold to other countries uh, across the Pacific. So, petroleum and natural gas. What about the oil and gas? Uh, these things will collect in pools underground, as it says. Uh, there's a lot of terms for this. If you get in the oil and gas industry, of your source rock, which is basically where did the stuff form? It's formed in the source rock, and there's the reservoir rock, which is basically where did it end up? Where is it being stored? And sometimes those can be the same thing. Uh, how does it get trapped? So this material actually gets trapped due to structural features and structural geology, which is, I probably told you in structural geology that structural geology is important because it's where you find the oil and gas. Um, and so there's a lot of different ways that the oil and gas can get trapped. So here we have kind of a simple anticline. And on top of the anticline, you can see that it's kind of sitting up here. So the oil is, and the oil and gas is lighter than the water. So it'll sit up on top of that. So if you figure out where an anticline is, 
and you have a geological formation that say is like uh, again sorry for those lines uh, sandstone sandstone is very porous and can hold a lot of liquids uh, and these are shales that are around it here uh, that's very not porous and tends to not hold liquids or doesn't transmit them very well uh, you can go put your hole here in the uh, on that anticline and pull up a lot of oil and gas in fact this is why there's tons of oil in Saudi Arabia is it's basically a giant anticline and there's tons of oil in there. Oh, uh, you have things where the formations can kind of pinch out and get caught. Sometimes faults can make things uh, get caught where you have a fault and things get cut off. And again, you can kind of look at these pictures and they're pretty self-explanatory. Uh, here you have reefs where things can kind of get caught in the reefs. I'm not going to draw arrows anymore. I'm just going to draw lines. Uh, this is what's happening in West Texas in the Permian Basin. Uh, you can have sandstone lenses or you can have salt domes. This salt dome thing is basically what's happening in the Gulf of Mexico. The Gulf of Mexico used to be a lot more closed off. Uh, because of that, the water was evaporating and a lot of salt would actually precipitate out of the ocean and just fall to the bottom and would collect. Uh, and then as the Gulf of Mexico kind of changed, more sediment came in due to kind of the ancestral Mississippi River and all the other rivers pouring into the Gulf of Mexico. And it buried this salt. Well, salt is that, excuse me, salt is actually kind of light. If you take a halite sample and kind of feel it, it's like it's, it's kind of soft and it's kind of light. It's not nearly as light as a sandstone or a shale or a siltstone. Uh, and because salt is kind of weird, it'll kind of act plasticky. So over millions of years, this salt will kind of bubble up and push up uh, through all the other sediment. And it'll kind of bend it up on the edge here. Uh, and that's where you'll get oil trapped. And I've worked on this stuff, boils and both as an oil and gas guy as an environmental guy. Uh, there's a famous um, catastrophe that happened in Louisiana um, where Texaco accidentally, <laughs> Texaco probably wouldn't admit it, but they accidentally drilled into one of these salt domes, which also had a salt mine in it. Uh, I highly recommend Googling that and watching that uh, if I haven't shown it to you in class or shown it to you elsewhere. Uh, it's very entertaining. It's old. There's like an old History Channel thing on it. So, I, you know, but there, I'm sure there's lots of other people, YouTubers that have talked about it and have good documentaries. It's a really interesting thing that happened. Nobody died, uh, but it emptied out this entire lake that f f got sucked down into the salt mine. It's kind of cool, but it's all because of, of uh, this stuff right here. So, where... Where are these things and how do we kind of remove the, uh, the oil and the gas? Um, yeah, there's negative effects to oil and gas drilling. I imagine that's not too big of a surprise. Uh, I'll talk about fracking here in a little bit because I'm uniquely positioned to have a very unbiased opinion of it because I've worked on both sides of it. Um, brine is an interesting thing to mention because here in Arkansas, lithium is becoming a thing because in southern Arkansas... Uh, where we've historically had this oil that we've removed out of southern Arkansas, there's also these saltwater brines. And in that salt, in those brines, sometimes instead of being NaCl, it is LiCl, and there's lots of lithium. So there's a good chance Arkansas is going to produ be producing, a, and I think already kind of is, producing a lot of lithium um, for batteries. So kind of cool. Uh, ignore that. I don't know how true that is. That's probably not true anymore. So here's a simple example of uh, getting oil out of the ground. And this same process, actually, you can use for environmental purposes. Uh, if you, you can pretend this oil is contamination, you know, uh, maybe it's something else. Um, you can inject water into the ground and then have a, uh, another well that's actually removing it. And you just kind of cycle it out and treat the water. But uh, basically, you can have injection wells nearby to where your production wells are, and you push down water, and then that water displaces the oil and pushes it up your thing. So I like, kind of like showing this, because if you drive around the country, you'll actually see a lot of these uh, horse head jack things kind of going off. And th this is what's going on there. This is, this is what they're doing. They're removing uh, oil from the ground in, in those regions. Ah, fracking. Fracking is a... Uh, uh, a shortened version to say hydraulic fracturing of low permeability shale like like we've learned shale things don't like to move through shale it's not very permeable or porous uh, but it's a lot less permeable than it is porous um, 
Yeah, and there's there's coal bed methane, and there's oil sands up in Canada, and those are kind of brutal to get stuff out of, and pretty environmentally damaging for the for the area. But the uh, the fracking is really occurring in the oil shale. Uh, also, uranium is is uh, I, I was surprised when I first learned about this how simple it was to get uranium out of the ground. It's actually something like this where you're injecting water through a formation that's just naturally radioactive for whatever reason. You know, usually a sandstone, and then uh, you're you're sucking up the water on the other end and it'll be naturally radioactive and now you kind of have lightly radioactive water and you kind of just go refine it remove the water and now you've got radioactive material and poof you've got uranium pretty easy if you look at pictures of it you'll just see these trucks with small drilling rigs and i was amazed i was like well that's why i don't nobody that i don't know any geologists that work in the uranium industry because it's just so easy to get out of the ground <laughs> it's cheap uh Here's a good map of where all the oil uh, and shale gas plays are. So we're talking about the shale, we're talking about the fracking, and again, this is a good map because it is from EIA.gov and very accurate. And as somebody who kind of worked in this industry for a few years, uh, yeah. So I actually worked up here in the uh, the Marcellus um, in uh, northeastern Pennsylvania when I was working on the oil rigs. This is basically what I did during the Great Recession. <laughs> Uh, and it's a little bit poetic because my grandfather or great-grandfather actually worked down here during the per Depression doing the same sort of thing. Uh, we also have a shale play here in Arkansas called the Fayetteville Shale. You can see the Fayetteville Shale coming out of the ground here up in Fayetteville, but it actually kind of dives down and gets deeper, and when it's deeper a few hundred feet down, there's some oil and natural gas in there. And uh, it's not very economical to get anymore. So think back to that kind of box I showed earlier. Um, it's just kind of too expensive. And there is still production happening, but we don't see new drilling happening there anymore. Uh, if you kind of go look up, there's a fun thing where you can go look up earthquakes that have happened throughout the U.S. Uh, a cool video that kind of shows earthquakes in the U.S. for the last, I don't know, 60 years or something. And you'll see a lot of small earthquakes that occur uh, in the Fayetteville Shale region, especially right here, um, due to the fracking. Uh, you'll also see a lot in Oklahoma and the Woodford. Uh, not all of these are created equal. Some of them are much bigger areas of production than others. The Marcellus here and the Utica are big ones. So definitely the Marcellus, the Bakken is a big one up here. Uh, Niobrara, I think, is a fairly big one. Um... The Eagleford is another big one. Um, Haynesville, I don't, I know more about that one. I don't know how big of a deal it is. Uh, the stuff in California, less so. Um, Niobrara is a significant one. There's multiple Niobrara's. Uh, yeah, but this is where a lot of the fracking is occurring. So, when I say fracking, what are we talking about? Okay, well, you have your oil rig here, and this is not to scale. The stuff I worked on, we would drill down a mile, and we would drill over a mile. Uh, that's pretty deep in the ground. A mile is way down in the ground in terms of groundwater. There's a lot of discussions about this, about uh, contaminated groundwater. When you're a mile down, the groundwater down here... Uh, it, it's it's usually been there for a million or two years, uh, and it's not going anywhere for a million and two or two years unless you're drilling down there to actually remove the water. So if you're drilling down here and you're actually getting your ground drinking water from this deep in the earth, uh, there's really not a whole lot to worry about this part of the fracking. Now, if in the geology you've got major faults, then yeah, that's something to pay attention to. If you fracture the ground down here. Uh, some of the chemicals used to do that or the oil and gas down there may creep up your fault uh, and, and, you know, move contamination up into groundwater that's a lot more shallow. Uh, but again, a mile is a long way. Typically, with the mistakes that I've seen where contamination can happen, happens right here with the casing of the well right near the surface. Uh, if you don't want contamination to happen, then you need to watch closely and monitor closely what's going on with this to make sure it's not messed up. Uh, other than that, some of the, the, the waste materials from this process kind of gets put into these ponds, and if these things leak, then yeah, it, it can be a problem. But to me, the actual fracking itself, the exploding of the rock, because that's kind of what you're doing. You're drilling down here into a shale. This is a shale down here. Uh, 
and then you're hydraulically pressuring it and getting it to break. So let me just get rid of all this. You're getting it to break, so all the oil and gas that's caught in the shale in here can then now move to your drill hole and come back out. And that was kind of the big thing with this technology was doing that and then combining it with directional drilling because honestly, this one drilling rig doesn't have to just drill here. Uh, it can drill there, it can drill over here and in all sorts of directions. So you see these old historical pictures where there's a bazillion of these drilling rigs, these towers sticking up all over the place. Well, now we don't need to put a bazillion of them in. We just put one and drill all over the place. And as one movie put it, uh, I drink your milkshake. So uh, the one thing you really can't, like, I think you can regulate this, this whole process and keep it from contaminating your groundwater, but you need to watch it closely. It requires regulation, it requires oversight, it requires good plans, and those plans need to be reviewed by a third party like the government. Uh, and you know what? That's expensive. And that takes time. Time is money. You're waiting on people to review this stuff, or they're coming out and looking at it, or you're having to do all these special little things. And do you know what that does? It makes the price of the resource go up. Is it worth it? You tell me. Did this guy living here in this house nearby? Whoa, yeah, it's worth it. He wants that, that regulation. But to you that's paying for the gas out here, do you want a whole bunch more regulation and oversight and technology and waiting that goes into this that's going to increase the price of gas 10%? Maybe you want a whole lot of regulation to really make sure no problems happen. 20%? 50%? Twice and double? It's not a simple black and white thing, and our big problems in today's society rarely are. When you look into the big issues that continually get discussed, uh, if there was an easy solution, the solution would probably be found and you wouldn't hear about the problem anymore. This is a balance. How much regulation and, and technology and, and money do we need to put, put into this to make sure we do it in as clean a way as possible? Let's, let's talk about climate change. These things are potentially causing emissions. You can see here there's this methane. So if you're drilling for oil, you don't care about methane, and methane is kind of hard to make money off of, so you just flare it off, right? It comes up your pipe. Uh, in fact, the flare is a good thing because you're basically burning the methane into CO2, and in terms of greenhouse gases, it's a lot better to have CO2 than methane. Uh, maybe you want to cap that. Maybe you want to keep that in the ground. Maybe you want to kind of filter that out and carbon capture it. Well, that costs more money. And again, that's going to make the cost of your gasoline go up because that cost is eventually going to get pushed on to you. So we all kind of have to decide, mostly through voting, uh, how much regulation that that we want, right? We kind of, and it's good to be aware of this. It's good to research this. It's good to understand this, um, so we can kind of educate our politicians, or you know, maybe some of you guys are going to be politicians someday, and you need to be aware of how this works because it's not a simple black or white thing. Uh, and and this process can absolutely ruin regions. I've worked on oil well blowouts where a, uh, a rig like this um, just e exploded, like the blowout preventer popped, didn't work, and this thing just spewed salt. This was in the near the Gulf of Mexico uh, in South Louisiana and just spewed salt water and oil over a 300 acre sugarcane farm for about two weeks. Uh, and it was ugly. And honestly, it wasn't the oil that was the worst part. The, it, the oil made it look really bad, but it was the salt water coming from that salt dome that actually destroyed the farmland for many years. Um, so if there had been better regulation, kind of watching out for that, making sure that that blowout preventer didn't explode, we wouldn't have ran into that problem. That farm wouldn't have been ruined. Kind of the fun thing about this story, though, is the... Uh, the oil company that was doing this was actually a fairly small oil company and the farm was part of this big conglomerate so the farms actually had a lot more money than the oil company did. But anyway, I won't go too in-depth into that. That's what's going on with fracking and honestly the one thing I can say that's really hard to get away from with fracking in terms of... Uh, of... Uh, problems... are earthquakes. If you do this fracking and there's nearby faults... Um, 
you can set off those faults. And we can see the results of this if we look at earthquake history, both here in central Arkansas or kind of north central Arkansas and in Oklahoma. Uh, there's been a lot of earthquakes due to this, this fracking. And luckily those earthquakes aren't very big, but you know, if you're in the wrong region of the country or planet or whatever, you could potentially set off a much larger fault uh, that could do a lot of damage. So I will say you can kind of regulate your way out of a lot of the issues that occur with this, but the, it's really hard to avoid the, the earthquake part. So that's oil and gas. Uh, in terms of that fracking stuff, sorry, that was probably really loud. In terms of that fracking stuff, a great source to listen to. There's a podcast called Science Versus. It's the only podcast I'll really listen to on road trips. Um, they do a lot of fun podcasts, but they do one on fracking. And it's pretty much the best piece of media I've ever seen on fracking because they do a very good job. In general, the Science Versus folks do a very good job at uh, adhering to science. They, they are going after the truth. They're going after... Um, these questions using the scientific method and being extremely thorough with their science. And that is how you get after the truth of things. You don't care about the answers you find. You are using the scientific method to find the answers and you don't care about your, whatever ideological background you've got. Uh, the, you know, the, the observations, the conclusions are the best, you know, we can get for the truth. Uh, so yeah, science versus fracking, good little 20 minute thing. They also have a really good one on, um, Yellowstone, if you're interested in that. Uh, I've probably talked about before in this class, uh, Yellowstone is not going to pop off in our lifetimes to end the world. So if you're hoping for the end of the world from the Yellowstone caldera, I'm sorry. It's, it's not going to happen in our lifetimes. We've studied it a whole lot. We've got so much technology on that and all the hand waving stuff from the discovery channel from 2010 just isn't accurate anymore. Anyway, let's talk about renewable energy. So, renewable energy is stuff that we can keep using. There's geothermal, solar, wind, hydroelectric, uh, and some, some other niche ones that maybe will take off, like kind of wave or tidal. Uh, geothermal is, you know, what I find kind of interesting is if you look at this energy and where it's really coming from, at the end of the day, just about all of it is star powered. And you're like, what? It, it's all kind of sun powered. Now, solar energy, yeah, that's fairly obvious. Wind power, wind exists on this planet because of the Coriolis effect and because of the heating of the sun. The earth spins and the sun's rays, the sunlight, hits the earth, heats things up, and we get this Coriolis effect, which is pushing all the gases all around in the atmosphere and that's what's causing the wind. So the wind is really there, one, because the earth is spinning and two, but two, because the sun is hitting the earth and warming things up. So wind power is kind of sun powered, solar power is obviously sun powered. Geothermal, slightly different question. Geothermal is kind of just, you can kind of say it's coming from the radioactivity of the earth or maybe a little bit more to it than that, but I can then relate that to sun power because the sun is basically just a giant nuclear reactor. Uh, and the interior of the Earth is kind of a small nuclear reactor. It's the same kind of physics. So it's all, I can even step back from being sun-powered and say it's all basically nuclear-powered. Um, hydroelectric power, same thing. Hydroelectric power occurs because the water is being evaporated from the oceans or lakes or what have you, and then it's going onto the land, and then it's raining down. So without that evaporative process, without the sun shining on it, you wouldn't get that water cycle to where you could, you know, dam up the rivers and create energy out of the dam. So it's kind of kind of nifty way to think about it. What oil, what about oil and gas? Oil, gas, and coal is from little, mostly little photosynthetic critters, you know, cyanobacteria type stuff, and plankton kind of dying in the water column and collecting. So without photosynthesis, you're probably not getting oil, natural gas, and coal. In fact, most of the coal that we process is from the Carboniferous, and all that stuff was trees. And those are definitely solar powered. So uh, kind of a nifty thing. But uh, anyway, so different type of energy sources. There's geothermal. You put a hole in the ground and it gets hotter as you go down. Solar energy. You've seen solar panels. You probably know how those things work. It's you get solar and you generate electrons moving from that. And the, 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 I won't go into the technology there because it's uh, I'm not going to say over my head, but over the head of this class. It's hydroelectric power, so you're damming things up with a dam and generating power through that. A lot of this stuff, 
you're turning a turbine. The goal is to turn a turbine, go take a physics class if you want to know what's going on with that, but you're basically turning a turbine to generate energy. Uh, geothermal does that. You put a hole in the ground and you send down some cold water and when it goes down, it gets hot, comes back up and turn a turbine with it. Uh, wind power, that's obvious, you're turning a turbine. Uh, hydroelectric, same thing. Water is going through your dam and it gets caught in this little whirly gig thing and it's turning a turbine. Solar energy is the one that's a little bit different. The solar panels aren't really turning a turbine. However, there are some old school kind of solar power plants where they're focusing light onto this one point and it's getting it really hot and they're using that to, uh, to turn a turbine. Uh, other sources, uh, economically, these aren't really off the ground. I kind of wonder some way if they will be. It's just a little bit harder to harness them. There's tidal power. Tides go in, tides go out. Basically think of turning a windmill upside down and putting it into an area that's got a lot of tides and poof, you have tidal power. There's problems with that though, with sediment getting kicked around and things being in the water. So I don't, it's not used a lot. Um, there's wave power, waves, you can kind of kind of do this pushing pull motion with the waves and probably use what's called Faraday's law to, uh, uh, to generate a little bit of electricity with that. Um, I know there's lots of technology that's kind of doing that, but again, it's not at a massive economic scale yet. Biofuels. When you go to the gas station and you see up to 10% ethanol or 15% ethanol or 5% ethanol or whatever, that ethanol is coming from corn that's grown here in the U.S. Uh, also, fun fact, that ethanol... It, it's alcohol, right? It's the same stuff in, in beer. They're just fermenting corn to get ethanol instead of fermenting hops or whatever else you may ferment for whatever, you know, your drink of preference is. Uh, so, you know, if you really wanted to, 15% ethanol in your gasoline, you could kind of get drunk off of, but don't, don't do that because gasoline will, the, re the rest of the stuff in there will kill you. Um, but it's just kind of a, a fun fact. Um, this topic of biofuels and in particular using corn grown here in the U.S. Uh, is a very fun topic. And honestly, whether I think it's a good idea or bad idea almost changes every semester with me. There's just so much involved with what's going on with it. And kind of at up front, it's a net loss in terms of energy. So all the energy you put into doing this, uh, you'd be better off just pulling more oil out of the ground. But doing this, um, there's a lot of reasons why it can be a good thing, right? So a lot of, you know, historically we've had dependence on foreign oil where we kind of need that oil from other countries. And, when you know, we get into wars in the Middle East because of that. And that's bad for everybody. Uh, so you can reduce your dependence on that because maybe this ethanol is actually a little bit cheaper to produce than going after foreign oil. What's happened in the last couple of decades, and I'll talk about here in the, this a little bit, is we're producing a lot more oil here in the United States uh, over the last 20 years than, than we used to. And honestly, we're not really dependent on foreign oil anymore. In fact, this whole catastrophe in Eastern Europe with the Russian invasion of Ukraine was kind of good for business for U.S. companies because all of a sudden... Europe was not getting Russia's oil anymore, gas, and so we went, ooh, we've got a lot. So our companies, you know, can kind of uh, uh, do well with that, or certain companies can. Um, the reasons for doing this, it makes farming more profitable for the farmers. There's a lot of socioeconomic reasons and cultural reasons in America that maybe that's a good thing. Maybe that's a bad thing. I don't know. It kind of depends on your viewpoint of it. Um, and like I said, I kind of seesaw back and forth whether this is a good thing or a bad thing. I, I, at my heart, in terms of being somebody who's in love with efficiency, I, I don't like it because there's better things. Uh, if it's more efficient to get it elsewhere, that's what I'd prefer to do. Um, instead of my tax dollars going to some farmers who could be growing something else instead. Uh, but again, I think it's also, it's a good idea to support our farmers and give them more business and sort of make this thing a homegrown thing instead of pulling more oil and gas out of the ground out of some foreign country. And there's also issues with pulling, pulling gas, you know, oil out of the ground anyway, 
from an environmental standpoint, there's maybe better reasons to do this. And you can talk about how there's limits on how much oil is in the ground to begin with. Um, so this is also maybe better to do it. So it's just, there's just so many variables. It's like the weather. It's hard to know whether the weather is, what, what the weather is going to be doing and, and whether it's a good thing or a bad thing. It just kind of depends on your perspective of it. Uh, I highly encourage you to kind of go research this more, develop your own opinion of it. Uh, maybe someday I'll kind of, well, I probably won't ever do a discussion on this because it's just not super geological. We're talking about corn here. Um, but, uh, yeah, let's see. There's a guy on YouTube I really like, Engineering Explained. He's kind of a uh, an engineer that I, I think has an obsession with cars, but he goes into this topic really deeply and I think does it justice um, and uh, you know covers a lot of the variables and sort of has... It's, it's, it's worth watching. Maybe I'll send you the link. If you're interested in it, shoot me a Canvas message about it, and I'll, I'll, I'll send you the link for that to watch because it, it, really, it really is kind of a an interesting problem, and it has all these different things coming to meet to be a part of that problem. So here's more data from the EIA. Uh, this is the annual U.S. electricity generation from all sectors from 1950 to 2020. And what do you notice? Well, first off, let's look at this. We've got coal as the yellow. We've got natural gas as the blue. We've got renewables as the green. Um, I think renewables in here, because it's 21%, likely includes hydroelectric. But if you look at the amount of electricity from hydroelectric dams in this country over the last several decades, it's pretty flat. Um, like it's, we're not adding more dams. Or if we are, we're losing just as many as we're adding. So this increase you see in renewables from about right here onwards, uh, that's from wind and solar, and especially wind. I think solar gets talked about more, but wind kind of took over first. Uh, and to see what I'm talking about, just drive across northern Oklahoma and Kansas, and you'll see all the wind turbines. Uh, if in the news you hear about how solar and wind are killing coal, no, they're not. Uh, it's fracking that killed coal. Natural gas is killing coal. Yeah, renewables are doing a little bit, but the big switch in this country from where our electricity comes from uh, happened right here. And guess what? That's right around 2008 when the fracking revolution happened. And natural gas became a lot cheaper because of it. A lot cheaper. When I was in college here uh, at the U of A, my rent was about as expensive as my electricity bill. Both were about 400 bucks a month. And I was, I was basically living in a trailer. Um, so yeah, the electricity bills aren't nearly that expensive anymore. And that's because I was, I was paying for that stuff back here. Uh, and then that fracking revolution happened Got a lot more cheap natural gas, a lot of power plants that burned coal, then switched to natural gas, and it just got energy so, so much cheaper uh, in this country. So that's kind of been the story uh, of, of energy uh, in this country. And again, this is for electricity generation. You don't see oil on here. You see natural gas and coal. We don't really burn oil for electricity. Um, that typically only happens in out-of-the-way places. Hawaii will burn oil for electricity because you can, it's easier to kind of ship the oil out there. Or maybe people with uh, off-grid cabins and things might, might use it. I saw that in Alaska a little bit when I lived there. Uh, but for the most part in this country, most of our electricity is coming from, uh, from natural gas. And some of it's from nuclear. This is always a sad thing for me. I think we should be gen generating a lot more from nuclear. I think it's just people are scared of it. And that's why we don't, don't do it. It's also kind of, it's a big investment. You have to throw millions and millions of dollars into developing a nuclear power plant, and it doesn't start paying money for 10 to 20 years. But once it gets going, oh, it's nice. Uh, in fact, here in uh, in Arkansas, we have what's called Arkansas One, which is a big nuclear power plant, and it generates like a third of Arkansas's electricity, and it kind of keeps our rates cheaper than a lot of other places in, this, in the country. Um... We do have coal power plants here. Here in northwest Arkansas, there's one just north of Siloam Springs. That's a 500 megawatt plant called Flint Creek. Um, and to compare, Arkansas 1, the nuclear power plant, generates three times the amount of electricity that that one fairly large coal power plant generates in Siloam Springs. 
Uh, a lot of our new electricity actually coming here in the northwest Arkansas is getting purchased from Oklahoma and Kansas from all those wind turbines they're putting out there. So all the growth, I should probably leave it on this slide. So all the growth from that's happening in northwest Arkansas, the electricity is coming from the new wind turbines put out in uh, Oklahoma and Kansas. So something to think about if you ever drive to Denver or something and see all those things. So here is oil production. So oil, the liquid, not natural gas, not coal, uh, from 1996 to 2018 for these three countries. So Saudi Arabia, Russia, and the U.S. And you'll notice circa about 2018, in terms of individual countries, if we ignore OPEC, which is a group of countries, in terms of individual countries, the United States now produces more oil than any country on planet Earth. That's kind of wild. And you'll notice that we went from not producing a whole lot here in 2011, 2012 to producing a lot more. What caused this? It was fracking. It was that fracking revolution. And honestly, that has changed geopolitics probably more than anything else. And you know what? You don't hear people talking about it. Uh, but once you're aware of this, all of a sudden, what's going on with countries around the planet in terms of geopolitics starts to make a lot more sense. This is important to know about. I think voters should know about this. Um, and they they just don't. So thanks for taking my class and, and learning this information. And again, this kind of data is on yaya.gov. Why do I think they're so good at data? Uh, these are government scientists and businessmen and engineers that are going after this information, pulling it out of the oil companies themselves because they keep track of all this information, right? The nice thing about oil or natural gas or gold coal coming and going out of the ground or being used is there's money involved. And so it's very easy to track how much of it goes where because there's dollars attached to it. And, you know, one of the neat things about a gas station, gas stations keep the gas underground. Wow, that sounds kind of dangerous. What if there's a leak? Well, the gas station knows real quick if there's a leak because that's money just floating out into the ground. So we don't have to worry too, too much about environmental problems about leaks out of gas stations because they solve their problems pretty fast. Uh, but yeah, similar sort of thing. The EIA kind of tracks this stuff, gets data from the companies, and it's... I, I, I don't think there's anybody that kind of claims like, oh, EIA's data is not very good. It's typically looked at as the creme de la creme to figure out, okay, what's going on with energy in our country especially, and they do the best they can with other countries around the world. Sometimes it's hard to get accurate information out of Russia or China or whatever. Um, but generally it's, it's, it's well respected, but yeah, this, this increase is a bit, a bit insane and a bit, a, a bit amazing. It's something to consider when you hear about, you know, think about what you know about politics in this country, about our two political system or two political parties and how they like to sling mud at each other and, and talk about these kind of problems. Uh, these trends changes, they don't match up with political party. You don't, you don't see the presidency change here and there, and you can't correlate these ups and downs with presidential changes. Um, it's it's apart from that. It's, it's separate from that. Okay. So that's oil and gas. If you have any questions about that stuff, ask me, but I'm probably just going to point you to cool things on EIA, EIA.gov. So, what about metallic resources? Uh, there's metal ores, and honestly, I don't know a ton about this because I haven't worked in this industry, and I don't have a lot of friends that work in this industry. So I'm going to go through this pretty quickly. Uh, a lot of these ores are typically formed by igneous processes. Um, a lot of it has to do with the crystal formations. A lot of it has to do with the hydrothermal fluid. So basically, you'll get water that's got a lot of other chemistry in it. And that water moving through those rocks can move that chemistry around, and that chemistry is the metals. Uh, and they'll get deposited in fractures and cracks and things within the, uh, the kind of the parent rock. Uh, we'll see it a lot around contact metamorphism. We'll see them around hydrothermal vents, um, other deposits, hot spring deposits. Here's kind of some simple looks at it. So you've got some uh, sedimentary rocks throughout here, and you've got this hot plutonic a bit of igneous rock and it's interacting with the fluids that are that are in here uh, and you'll get areas where metals will precipitate out, out into these areas. Um, similar sort of thing happening here. Uh, here you have a hot pluton 
Um, what is that? That's basically hot igneous rock. So it's igneous rock that hasn't quite cooled all the way off yet. It's not necessarily a magma. It's just a hot rock. Uh, you'll get liquids, water that's basically interacting with this pluton, and it'll flow up, and you'll get things collecting in these veins. This is fairly common. Uh, same sort of thing will happen at hot springs here in the oceanic crust, where you have... Um, you know, your mid-Atlantic or your, your oceanic ridges where oceanic crust is being created. You'll get hydrothermal vents there. So very similar thing with the hydrothermal vents happening at the Hawk Springs. we will get a lot of metals kind of forming uh, in these areas. And these areas might get, you know, think about these things happening and then plate tectonics happen. So then this, this stuff gets pushed up over millions of years onto a continent or something. So it may have happened 50 million years ago, but now it's kind of up on the side of a continent. And now it's kind of part of a mountain. So you can go to that mountain and just Mine it. Uh, you can get surface processes where this stuff forms in chemical precipitations in just the layers of sedimentary rocks. A good example of this is the banded iron formations, which hopefully I've talked about or somebody talked about in the two-scale timescale project that I like to do. Uh, if we look at that, that's the banded iron formations. This is basically alternating layers of hematite, metallic, and non-metallic. Uh, hematite is an iron oxide. It's like Fe2O3 or something close to that. Uh, and so there's lots and lots of iron in that stuff. Uh, there's placer deposits. These are basically sedimentary deposits that have been organized by stream process processes. And what I want you to think about here with this is imagine you're panning for gold. How does panning for gold work? Do I have a plate anywhere? Here's a coffee mug. Imagine this is my pan. I'm panning for gold. So I put some sediment in here with some water, and it's a nice big flat pan, and I'm just kind of swirling it around. And what you're trying to do with that is you're trying to get the heavy stuff to settle at the bottom because gold is typically heavier than everything else around it. Or, you know, it doesn't have to be gold. It can be other, other metals as well. But those metals are typically heavier than the other uh, minerals around it. And so you're just essentially trying to get the heavy stuff to settle to the bottom and then pour the lighter the lighter stuff out. Mm, it's some delicious gold. Black gold. Uh, oh, there's concentration by weathering. We may or may not talk about bauxite in this class, but bauxite is this weird kind of uh, weathering of a rock where you can get aluminum ore from it. How do we get this stuff out of the ground? How do we mine it? There's a lot of different ways. Uh, there's strip mining, open pit mining. These are typically seen as bad, bad things from an environmental standpoint. There's placer mining. Historically, that's kind of a fun thing, especially up in Alaska. Uh, there's bedrock mining. And these things have negative environmental effects. So here that is blown up. There's the old school way of putting holes in the ground with the carts and everything. You've seen this in Indiana Jones. Uh, there's the big open pit mines. This is fairly common. And this can be done with more than just, in fact, all of this can be done with more than just metals. It can be done with other things. You can see the, the coal bed here. If you've ever heard of, uh, uh, what is it, mountaintop mining, where they basically take off the top of these mountains in places like uh, West Virginia to get at the coal. Uh, there's a lot of environmental reasons why people don't like that, but it is one way to get it out. Uh, this is kind of your placer mining here with river bars and stuff. That's fairly rare. Uh, what you see mostly these days is this kind of open pit mining stuff. Um, what are some environmental concerns of this? Well, for one, you can probably figure out that this is pretty brutal when you put in a giant open pit. Uh, but one big problem that occurs with this is this right here. It's all your leftovers. It's what you call your tailings pile. Now, what you've done is you've taken all of this geology that's been sitting there all nice and... You know, the, the water is not really hitting it, or it's barely hitting it, or the water that's moving through it. Or it's been moving through it for millions of years, and there's not a whole lot leaching out of it. Well, when you bust it up and set it over here in a pile, now all of a sudden there's all this surface area that water, rainwater, can get to and touch, and you can leach out different types of chemistry. So if you've ever heard of acid mine drainage, this is what's going on. So you'll get that water that hits that, that rainwater that hits that, and then it'll flow off into a river, and it'll contaminate that river, kill the fish, and hopefully not other people downstream that are drinking it. Uh, but this is a big problem that exists with mining. There are ways to kind of environmentally mitigate this. In fact, I, I did a field course where uh, we went and measured water quality from different, from runoff from different tailings piles, and then... Uh, 
and then kind of measured the river that it ran into and we measured the river upstream and downstream and this was a college course so we were all like ah this isn't contaminating the river and after we did a little measuring so we were like wow this is contaminating the river why isn't anybody doing anything about this uh and you know that's just the nature of things and sometimes things were being done about it there were these retention ponds to make it less bad but sometimes you know you can only do as much as you've got funding for uh, and putting in more retention ponds in that area just maybe wasn't possible. So you're just doing the best you can with, with what you got. Um, in general, with the environmental stuff, that's, you know, I've, as I've mentioned before with the fracking, that, that is kind of the balance. How much are you willing to spend to deal with the environmental effects of these things? I wish there were just billions of dollars sitting somewhere and we could fix everything. That's just not the truth of it. If we're going to tax everybody for billions of dollars so we can fix every environmental problem, well, guess what? You now have no money left because you're being taxed to solve all these problems. And some of these problems are definitely worth throwing a lot of money at because they could potentially hurt a lot of people or they're hurting other resources. Uh, you can go Google the, the mines in Alaska and you'll see Red Dog Mine and how it's potentially threatening salmon fisheries. So there's this big, you know, uh, love-hate relationship with the... Uh, these different industries in, in Alaska where you have environmental problems, but you have these economies that are also dealing with this. And it's like, hey, it would be nice to have that mine there. That's that's good for the economy. But, hey, not if it kills our salmon fishery, because which that's also a big part of the economy. So it's, you know, it can be very complex. And it's all about kind of creating, creating a balance. Uh, I'll talk later on about climate change. The, to me, that's kind of the ultimate environmental problem. Uh, in, in my opinion, this stuff, you know, I, I trend towards these are good things. Like if we can get cheap natural resources and build a, a better society with this stuff, have better access to resources that we need to live happier lives, live healthier lives. Uh, and all you've got to do is destroy this football field sized piece of land. Yeah, do it. But, you know, you have to do it in a way where you, you know, you need to have concern about the people that live around these regions and the effects that these places are going to have years after they're shut down. Um, but in general, I'm all for it. So if you hear talk about, oh, we can't mine cobalt for batteries for electric cars because, you know, it destroys, it's, it's an environmental problem. Yeah, it's an environmental problem for where that mine's going to be. I totally agree, and that sucks. But the alternative is worse greenhouse gas emissions, and that's bad for the entire planet. And I'll get into the problems with climate change a little later, but it's it's the socioeconomic stuff in climate change that has me so worried. Rising sea levels? Yeah, so what? Um, major droughts and major floods? Yeah, so what? But it's the human response to those things, where you have farming that's failing at certain latitudes. And all those people are trying to migrate to other countries because of that failure of farming. Uh, that, that starts wars. And if you don't understand that climate change is a part of that problem, then, well, that, that's a problem, isn't it? Because then you just start blaming other people instead of focusing on this underlying problem. That's why I think education towards kind of uh, addressing and understanding climate change and greenhouse gas emissions is such a big deal. But in general, I'm all for destroying a little, you know, small piece of planet Earth to help stop destroying all of planet Earth and causing a major, major mass extinction. It's all a balance. Anyway, non-metallic resources. Uh, there's non-metallic resources. This is what a lot of the mines you see are, are doing. It's stuff that's going after materials that's good for making concrete and asphalt and all these things we see around us. Uh, that are fairly common. Uh, gypsum. Gypsum. There's walls all around me. Back here. You see this white stuff back? Boy, it's hard to do this. This white stuff back here. That's uh, made out of gypsum. That's drywall. Uh, that's gypsum board. So there's gypsum mines to make that stuff. Um, and of course, gravel and limestones use all sorts of things and sand as well. And like I said, we have a lot of these mines here in, uh, in northwest Arkansas. Uh, you're, there's also these mines for fertilizers and evaporites. There's salt mines and those salt domes near the Gulf of Mexico. And a lot of the salt that gets put on the roads around here when they freeze up uh, comes from those salt domes. It gets trucked up here and then we spread it out all over the place. Uh, so, you know, be thankful that uh, 
that the Gulf of Mexico closed off a little bit during, during the Jurassic and gave us all these salt deposits so we could then go mine them and spread salt on the roads to make them less slick. Because if we didn't have that, salt would probably be a lot more expensive around here and maybe we wouldn't be able to afford putting salt on the roads uh, when they ice. Uh, there's all sorts of other non-metallic stuff. So there's gemstones. Arkansas is definitely famous for their diamonds. Uh, it's in fact, it's the only place that normal people can go mine for diamonds. You can go down to Murfreesboro uh, in kind of western, central, south Arkansas. Uh, kind of, you know, if this is Arkansas, it's, it's like over here on kind of the western. Anyway, you can Google it. Uh, and you can pay like 15 bucks and go, go mine diamonds there if you want. Uh, I highly recommend doing it once for a couple hours to see what it's all about. You're probably not going to find any diamonds. Uh, and then spend the rest of your day over at the quartz mines and do that. Cause you'll find a lot of quartz. Uh, but it's so hard to find, find diamonds. I've been there with piles of other geologists for a day or two and like nobody found anything. However, if you really want to increase your chance of finding a diamond there, you go there in the morning when the sun's coming up and it needs to be a sunny day and you do it when there's been rain that night. So the rain has washed off a lot of material and so you can see a sparkly diamond. You don't sit there and dig for them, you move. You're, you're moving, you're looking for a sparkly thing, something that's just kind of, you know, vitreous and clear that's on the surface and you get there before anybody else when that sun is up and you cruise and you move. And if you've got like 10-year-olds that have good eyesight, you bring them. They're closer to the ground. They can see better. They're excited to do this, and you set them moving. I'm not joking. It sounds like a joke. We used to do this when we were digging for fossils uh, along a riverbed in South Louisiana um, because the fossils were kind of just coming out of the riverbed and not necessarily the edges. We would just show kids, like, okay, here's what these fossils kind of look like. Uh, go. Go. And if you find something, let us know, pin, put a pin flag on it or whatever. But because you're so much closer to the ground, you have better eyesight. Those kids were fantastic at finding fossils. You could do the same thing with the diamonds. Uh, and there's, there's other stuff. Which I'm not going to go into because this is probably running a little longer than I'd prefer it to. Um, you know, the, these... This is kind of the things I've been harping on throughout the, the lecture and that there's a balance for this. We want cheaper resources, right? You don't, if you don't like greenhouse gases and you don't like the, uh, the pollution that oil and gas creates, or let's just specify oil, uh, okay, uh, let's get rid of that. Well, what's that, what's that going to do? If you hinder the production of that, uh, now the price of gas at the gas pump is going to skyrocket to 10 or $15. And I've been places where things happen and gas, I've seen $15 a gallon before in a, in a place that had been cut off due to, uh, uh flooding problems. Um, and whew, it's tough to live life when gas is $15 a gallon. Um, especially when you think about all the products you buy at the, the grocery store, Th those got there in a truck, right? And that truck, had gas in it and somebody had to pay for that gas so um if they got to pay for that gas guess what they're pass passing the cost on to you with those products and now it's not just your gas is 15 bucks a gallon but your gallon of milk is also 20 dollars. there's a balance and there's no perfect answer for it N nobody knows everything about everything so it's all about having discussions with people who understand and who are experts in various realms of of society with you know sociologists and economists and environmental scientists and geologists and climate scientists and all this stuff and figuring out okay what's the balance what's what's worth it because there's eight billion people on this planet that means we are going to change the planet that we can't help it right eight billion people that's a lot so we have to decide how we're going to harm our environment and do the best we can of not harming it to what kind of resources we're going to take from it. And understand that we do exist in an ecosystem on planet Earth and that if we damage it enough, it will cause a mass extinction. And the more we damage it, the worse the mass extinction is. And that mass extinction will include us. And it already is. There are things that are getting more expensive these days due to climate change, due to environmental de disasters. And there are people around this planet that are very poor and don't have access to the kind of technologies and, and society and culture that we've got here. Uh, and it's 
that's killing them. That's killing them. Um, and part of that is we're in the middle of a mass extinction due in part to climate change. And that's only going to going to get worse. And those animals dying, those those species dying, we are dependent upon them. And the other species we're dependent upon, the things they're dependent upon, those things are dying. So it's it's all part of an interconnected network. Uh, and so we we have to be careful. And, and unless we want to just start eating each other, uh, which that's not sustainable either. Uh, there's an old sci-fi uh, that talks about that called Soylent Green. Feel free to Google it. Uh, this is something to be concerned about, but it's not black or white. It's a very complex problem with a lot of moving parts, and it's something we have to have discussions on, and it's something our leaders need to know about and need to be informed about, and that's just why they need to be educated, and they need to understand how to talk to various experts who do know more about these problems and more about these systems in general. Uh, so, hope you got something from that. Um, yeah. Let me know if you have any questions or comments, things you want to add. I'd, I'd love to hear it. Have a good one.